The fact is that the <clears throat> urgency of existential questions relating to the long-term sustainability of our societies have gradually been given an increased priority on, in the global community. And this development is reflected in numerous uh, international agreements and multilateral policy declarations. And this is a process starting in the 1970s with the Stockholm Declaration, coming to fruition through the Rio Declaration, the Brundtland Report. We have the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, implemented through the Kyoto Protocol, later the Paris Agreement. And we also have the United Nations Millennium Goals, which were then expanded as recently as 2015 into Agenda 2030 with the 17 SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. And to make these goals come true, that is certainly a collective responsibility where the academy has an important part to play in several ways. In, within all our disciplines that are related to the sustainability perspectives. We have a far-reaching cooperation with and engagement in surrounding society. We have a conscious integration of sustainability perspectives into our educational programs. And when we speak about sustainability here, we take our base in the Brundtland Report, a wide concept including social, economic, and ecological <clears throat> This integration into our educational programs, I would say, is perhaps the greatest vehicle for impact on the future development that we have. Because we educate young people who come here as talented students and leave this school as managers, lawyers, economists, judges, in positions in society where you actually have power and with power follows responsibility. Now, against this backdrop, I wish all of you, and in particular our keynote speaker, Jan, an alumni of this school, wholeheartedly welcome to this seminar that has the ambition to spur us for further, in further attainment of our common quest for a sustainable future. The seminar will commence with a presentation by Jan and continue in an open discussion moderated by Lena and Christine. So once again, very welcome and I'm looking forward to this seminar. Thank you. Great to be back. Uh, I graduated from this uh, uh, school uh, in, well, I won't repeat the year. <laughs> and uh, I have had great uh, help in my life and uh, uh, encouragement and, uh, in, uh, I would say, inspiration from my three years here at the time. So um, what you are laying now, is, all of you in this room, is laying a basis for your own future. And uh, you will notice that the studies you are Having here our value in themselves, but also the uh, network that you establish among yourself. Uh, because uh, the most important word in the world today is together. You will find that it is only when you work horizontally, when you mobilize uh, the capacities of others, that you really will be successful. To me now, the borderline between uh, national and international is uh, slowly or rather rapidly, I would say, some extent, to some extent, uh, disappearing. There is great difficulties to identify something as purely national or international. Uh, if you look at an issue like migration, refugees, uh, if you look at uh, an issue like climate change, you can't draw the line between what, between what is national and international. And I would claim that a good international solution a good international solution. I think the SDGs and the Paris Agreement in December 2015 are such good national, international uh, norms and solutions. A good international solution is in the national interest of member states. 
Think about that. It is in the national interest to conclude good international agreements. I wish President Trump would come to that conclusion, or the American Congress. <laughs> doubt that they do so. It's harder for bigger countries like US, Russia, and China to come to that conclusion than it is for a country like Sweden, who is so, which is so dependent on the outside world. So the international agreement is a national interest, if it's a good agreement. In reverse, I would say, though, that a, the work that you and above all your parents and grandparents did to build this country, uh, to, to build a good society that is fair and functioning well, where justice prevails, where human rights are respected, where inequalities are fought, and where you sort of accept the principle of every, the truth, in my view, of every human being's equal worth. Such a society, building such a society, is not only good for the people who live in our countries, the Nordic countries, for instance, where this, these principles in general are valid, but it is also a contribution to international peace and security. I've visited 104 countries, I recognized when I counted the other day. <laughs> and I must say, having traveled around the world, crossing borders in uh, Central Asia, in Africa, in Asia, it has often been uh, combined with the risk of, for your life to cross into the enemy territory in the other country. While we, you here in the Nordic countries, live in this heavenly situation of crossing a border and you are thinking about a hut in Norway and good food in Denmark and Finland's Botten, you know. So it's a pleasurable relationship, but we are also strongly cooperating among ourselves. This is a strength, an enormously important strength for, for our countries. And therefore, uh, what I've seen in those countries is that if you don't have that, those aspects of domestic work, justice, well-functioning institutions, human rights, fair distribution of income and wealth, then you have tensions inside the country. And if you then go further, they go further and discriminate and, and, uh, and uh, punish people with different uh, beliefs or ethnic or religious backgrounds, then you have the beginning of civil wars and possibly later on through proxy wars, a mechanism, international conflicts. So in other words, the, word is, the, the work is that is being done inside countries to create healthy, balanced societies is a contribution to peace. And that's what these goals, for the first time in human history, are recognizing. Those goals are recognizing that there is no peace without development. But also that there is no development without peace. And then thirdly, that there is neither peace nor development without respect of human rights and rule of law and well-functioning institutions. That's the whole, that's the formula for, for that work that we'll be doing for four and a half years. Tendencies right now. I thought I would start by giving my reading of the global landscape uh, as I see it now. I could go on for hours and hours and you wouldn't uh, stand all the details. So I will do it rather sketchily, but you can pick, it, pick up the different aspects in your questions or comments after my, my introduction. So I would start with four reasons for worry, four threats that I see. And then I will quickly move to, in order for you not to go into deep depression, I will go into four reasons for hope. Okay, the uh, threats. Well, the most obvious thing for me to start with is, of course, war. Uh, we have had bombings from three Western powers in Syria the other day. Uh, and we have a very high degree of tension between the US and Russia in particular, and the West and Russia, I would say. It's even worse than it was during the Cold War right now. I am very critical of the lack of dialogue between the West and Russia. That includes Sweden also, by the way. Even if you have different views on things like Syria or Ukraine, you should be able to use diplomacy to, to talk. But this tension is very high. And what I found difficult, uh, Christine, you mentioned my mediation work. I have mediated in six conflicts. I still say that uh, to mediate in today's conflicts, is much more complicated than it was when I was mediating in Iran, Iraq, Nagorno-Karabakh, Sudan, Somalia, Burma, whatever. 
because there are a couple of elements that have complicated negotiations. One is uh, the growing role of ethnic and religious factors in conflicts. Because when the ethnic and religious dimension enter a conflict, you also enter a more emotional element. You cannot speak rationally like it was a question of drawing a borderline or uh, coming to agreement on the release of prisoners and so forth. It's uh, very much irrational. And since nowadays leaders ruthlessly use the ethnic and religious, religious reasons to, to divide nations and polarize nations and exploit the fact that when people are living in an insecure situation, they often turn to their own ethnic group or their own religious group. And that means that they automatically start to divide us into us and them. And the us is always here, and the them is here. You start to slide on the every human, be, every human being's equal value. And that has entered conflicts now. Practically all the conflicts that we struggle with have this element and make the mediation negotiation so much more difficult. The second complication is a phenomenon that I called, I think I said it in passing earlier, proxy wars. In other words, when you have a conflict, you have also neighboring states and often um, great powers playing out their own interests on the territory of those countries in conflict. So the curse of the UN for the last eight years, and I lived through five of them, was my biggest frustration, my biggest uh, disappointment, was the fact that we couldn't reach peace in Syria. And the reason, one of the reasons at least, is that the, the conflict had to be dealt with on three levels. And we had to have the right constellation on all three levels in order to have peace. And this has never occurred, up until today. And it doesn't look very good for the next few months and years either. It has to be a recognition of interest on the ground, 2011-12. It could have been an easy thing to find a solution because the opposition in Syria was unified and uh, Kofi Annan at that time came out with a formula of a transitional governing body with full executive powers that could work out a constitutional election. That could have been the formula for peace, 2012. Uh, but then came I ISIS, which didn't exist before 2011, was created, and the terrorist element grew in the opposition and made the opposition very ma difficult to manage and deal with. Uh, and then the second level. All the neighbors have their own interests in Syria. Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, supporting the opposition mostly. Now Turkey is swaying a little bit. And you have Iran and Russia supporting the government. So what is happening is that this proxy wars, that's where you gather your ambitions, your national interests. Even now, US and Russia, if I come to the third level, Security Council completely immobilized because of this tension. So you have three levels because of this proxy war phenomenon that occurs. The second threat, now I, by this I want to say how difficult it is to, to achieve peace in Syria. Uh, the, second, uh, the second issue is of course the nuclear uh, risks, the nu risks of nuclear war that we face in above all North Korea, around North Korea I would say. Uh, the situation has improved the last three months because the North and South in Korea have realized that it's their future, their existence, which is at stake. So they have started a dialogue which fortunately has been allowed to proceed. And that means that there's been an element of dialogue that has had a very healthy effect on the, on the crisis. So the uh, leaders of North Korea and South Korea will meet on the 27th of April, very soon. And then it is planned, as you know, to have a summit meeting between Kim Jong-un and President Trump. I wish I could be a fly on the wall during that meeting. Uh, in the end of May or beginning of June. 
So we'll see. I hope this will be a process which moves in the direction of a solution, which will be very complicated because the North will insist on guarantees that their existence will be uh, be uh, guaranteed. That they will get guaranteed to have good ex uh, continued existence of their regime, and they also want to have a peace agreement, which is a rather large uh, demand. And on this, the American side, they want to have a denuclearization. De de and if they want denuclearization within a very short period of time, it's going to be complicated. As a long-term goal, I think it's definitely recognizable and, and understandable. I'll move on. Third, third threat. I hope you don't go into depression now, please. The third, the third threat is, uh, of course, the existential issue. Uh, which we are landing in your knees, unfortunately, earlier generations, namely the uh, uh, climate change threat and the uh, environmental degradation that has continued for so long and is becoming an existential threat for our, for our world and our people. And here I, I have a line that you may have heard, but I always say that you may have plan B in your life when people tell you, I have a good idea. you have a good idea. Well, if they don't believe it, say, what's your plan B? Well, when it comes to climate, there is certainly no planet B. There is no planet B. And we have to understand that the second most important, or equally important word as together, which I said in the beginning, is the word responsibility. We have to accept responsibility for changing the life patterns and do all this in order to implement this uh, plan for 2030. Not only because of that agreement, but also because of the Paris Agreement. I would say that the Paris Agreement lacks their own plan of action, but it is actually, this is also the plan of action for the Paris Agreement. Uh, I come back to that on the, L, on the, on the part on, on hope. Okay, the last uh, threat I would mention is something I've hinted at already. And that is this creeping fear factor that is growing inside nations and leading to simplification of realities. Um, unfortunately, the modern information and communication technology, which I, from the beginning, thought was completely just good news, but of course now we have recognized that there is also elements in this new technology which has added a rather hysterical element to the production of news, and also lack of checking facts, the evidence-based facts, which is your mission here at the university, at the school of your own school, is absolutely crucial. And we are losing that sense. We have even now come to a stage where it seems that it doesn't matter whether something is true or false. Uh, you may have a politically successful uh, voyage ahead of you, like President Trump and certain politicians in Europe. And you can do it on open lies. This has never happened, as I can recall. And if we reach into this situation where that line disappears, and we only read headlines, and, uh, and uh, they live their own life, whether it's truth or lies, then we are in real trouble. That is being possible, made possible because of this polarization that I mentioned earlier. Because you are so firmly rooted with your own camp, with your own group, that you completely disregard that other group. And the polarization goes deeper. And I give you four reasons for, for hope. The first uh, will probably please uh, half of the members in this room. Uh, but I think it should, ha should, should be a good thing for all of us in this room. And the first good news is women. This is the most important good news in today's world, women. It's, uh, for the first time in history, I looked at the women here, for the first time in history, we will reach, during your lifetime, full equality. You will reach full empowerment, full emancipation. This has never happened in human history. It is about to happen. Uh, we've seen it very strongly in our own country. We still have a way to go there, also, here. But in the world, I can see it. In my visits to my 104 countries, it's so obvious. I'll go to West Africa, the whole trade and retail trade is in the hands of women, and they are completely, they are the bosses. 
I go to uh, Rwanda and I see the parliament has more women than men. Uh, unfortunately, there is a tragic background to that also, uh, the genocide of 1994. And I go to, I go to presidents in Africa, Asia, Latin America, women, 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 women chosen as the leaders of nations. I'm, re I'm regretting that Sweden, which, is so, which should be so progress progressive, <laughs> hasn't still uh, produced a uh, head of government who is a woman. But it's about to come, isn't it? Maybe one of you in this room will be taking over that job someday. Second good news is young people. I believe that there is an absolutely untapped resource in young people. Not only uh, young people in your age, most of you in this room, but also even younger. I have nine grandchildren. I'm a very fortunate grandfather. And I am now visiting the schools of my grandchildren. I've been to Tebe, eighth graders, 15 years old. I've been to uh, Adolf Fredrik, fourth graders, my granddaughter, Agnes. And they are so smart. They know what, what is right and wrong. They pose the right question about the climate and environment. They pose the right question about war and peace, about living together, about human rights, although they don't call it human rights. And I think we, we should change attitude. We shouldn't paternalistically think of working for young people only. We must do that. It's very important. But I think we should more and more think of that we should work with young people. With young people. Talk with you, and even those younger, about the future, about the uh, education, the training they should have, the jobs, opportunities, and their desires and in, sort of aspirations for life. And I think that would create a tremendously most dyna more dynamic uh, strength into our societies. And I think our organizations should take this on. I tried very hard to do work in this direction in the UN. Uh, the third good news is knowledge. You are in the knowledge industry here. Uh, and I want to say to you, everything you learn is something that adds a tool to your toolbox. You, the knowledge that is, is such a liberating force. Uh, and it has to be used to also produce the results in all these 17 sectors. We need, uh, we need so much of... Uh, the contributions from the academic world, but also, of course, the business world, the civil society. And we need to mobilize horizontally if we are to re achieve results. Uh, the, the, um, the last, not the last hope, that would be too dramatic, but the fourth uh, hope would be uh, international cooperation. And it is very sad that you have now have such open confrontation to free trade, to the climate agreement, to migration of refugees as a potentially positive force, and only identifying the negative things and the dangers, according to some. And uh, if we go this direction, I think we are in real trouble. And me, I have served my life as, as diplomat, and I think in today's world I see a serious lack of uh, diplomacy. I think we have a dialogue and diplomacy deficit. People go to choose military solutions. You and I talked about in the elevator today, Per. First you do the military uh, move, and then you start to talk about dialogue. It's the other way around. We are in the business, we should be in the business of chapter six of the UN Charter, Pacific Settlement Disputes, peaceful settlement disputes first, and talk. Diplomatic relations, by the way, doesn't automatically mean good relations. I have delivered a lot of bad news to lots of leaders in the world in the name of diplomatic relations. So I think uh, this is the, the untapped resources. But here I come to the best news on this, this fourth uh, hope factor, and that is these SDGs. We worked very hard to uh, achieve them. Uh, it was uh, four and a half years, as I said, of hard work. We were ridiculed in the beginning uh, because we aimed for a rather large group of goals. 17, and it wasn't taken seriously. But now it turns out when we have these goals, they are really a well thought through uh, entity, a whole, there's a whole, a comprehensive character to them, which I just I want to, um, I want to uh, elaborate a little bit upon. 
the key word for the words for the global goals. And we have decided to use the global goals as the, the term in our public presentation from the UN. Uh, but I, I don't want to lose the key word, namely sustainability. So all of these goals builds on the principle of sustainability, that we need to make sure that we uh, reflect a move that I would call a move in the direction of peace with nature. The second aspect of these goals is the word universal. Universal, uh, I want to say to you that uh, if you compare these goals with the earlier generational goals, the Millennium Development Goals, MDGs, between 2000 and 2015, you would find that those goals were eight goals. Seven out of these eight goals were only directed to the developing countries. Only one goal related to the uh, rich part of the world. Partnership. Goal number eight. Now it's goal number 17. In other words, if we are to reach these goals, we need to have as much of a mobilization in the rich countries, the developed countries, than in the poor countries, developing countries. By the way, I, I start to end using developed and developing. I think we are all developing countries, by the way. But anyway, uh, it is something we have to do. You can imagine what, how much of this is for the for the rich countries to think about. You have climate action, you have life on water, life on land, you have, uh, you have energy, you have uh, cities. Well, I could go all over here. I think it has to be done here. And I'm glad the Swedish government has organized themselves accordingly. We have Isabella Levine, who is the Minister of, uh, of Development Assistance, but we also have Minister uh, uh, Ardalan Shekarabi, who has the implementation work inside our own country. So the, it's very important that we, this sustainability drive is permeating uh, all countries, including the rich. Otherwise, this, these goals will not be attained. The third aspect of the goals is that they are mutually reinforcing. It's incredibly interesting to see how they connect with each other. Generally speaking, I think we should avoid this silo organization and think about it, we can solve issues only in the silos vertically. If we are to solve problems in today's world, we have to go horizontal. By that, by the way, I don't mean go to sleep. Someone misunderstood that once. We have to work horizontally. But if, for instance, if you look at the goal of water, the goal six here, blue, appropriately. If you do water right, water sanitation hygiene, which I worked with for 25 years, Christine, you mentioned that. You, if you do that right, you reduce child mortality, you, reduce, you improve maternal health, you improve education and equality and extreme poverty. Five of the old MDGs are affected by doing water right. Same goes for all of them here. And I had an interesting experience. I was in preparation for the agreement in September 2015. I went to Asia to uh, mobilize finance ministers, because this re requires resources. So I was there uh, to mobilize finance ministers, and I must tell, most of the finance ministers didn't know a thing about these SDGs, except in one country, South Korea. The fi finance minister was absolutely whiz kid on these goals. He knew everything about what we were negotiating about. So I said to him after the meeting, Minister, how come you're so extremely well informed about these goals? Well, I am Minister of Finance and Budget, but I am also Minister of Economic and Strategic Planning. In other words, his job was to also think about something which was necessary for a f in a five-year perspective, a 10-year perspective, which means that he had to know how the world would look like 2030 on the basis of these goals. And these goals are now sort of instruments for planning in many, many countries. And it's really remarkable to see how, how, per, how this has permeated the work. But here, I think the main point I want to make on these goals are related to two goals here, peace and the 16 and 17. S 16 is the one that, that confirms what I said earlier, peace, no peace without development, no development without peace and none of the above without respect to human rights. Because the first part of that goal is peaceful societies. If you don't have peaceful societies, you can have no development. 
You can just look at Yemen and <laughs> Syria to understand the point. But they also have access to justice and well-functioning institutions as a basis for progress. And I want particularly to stress well-functioning institutions. And here I want to give you a, a little short personal story. I was the first one to graduate in my family, uh, graduate from even high school. My father had seven years of school. My mother had four years of school. Uh, I lived in one room in Koltorp here. We had, I saw my first bathtub at age 10. So my father and mother had come out of almost extreme poverty and invested in me and my brother to have our education. So when I graduated, took my, student, took my degree, student examen, I asked my father, what do you think, what was the reason why Sweden developed so fast from one of the poorest countries as we were in the 20s and 30s, believe it or not. Sweden, Finland and Norway were very low in the European Welfare League, so to speak. And my father said, I think it's three things. He said, first, uh, we borrowed money in the 30s to build infrastructure. He, used, he didn't use the word infrastructure. We built roads, railroads, hospitals, schools, which later constituted a well-functioning public sector. And that gave us jobs. He worked at SKF, SKF here, ball bearing factory. And gave me jobs. So, um, and then you were born. And the second thing we did, the second reason why we developed was that we decided that Every kid that had a talent for studying and wanted to study should be able to study for free without paying one krona from grade one to university. And you are the first one, pointed to me, to have this opportunity. Talk about expectations, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, and this is the point about institutions, goal 16. We put the best people we could think of to run our cities, here in Gothenburg, in Westjutland, in Obovisland, around here, in the uh, authorities in Stockholm, in the government. We put people who really devo were devoted, and they had to do their absolutely best. They had to work very hard, and they were our servants, tjänstemän. Tjänstemän, think of the word tjänsta, at tjäna, in English, international civil servant. And uh, if corruption would ever occur, they are out. So institutions was really one of the reasons why we turned it to this type of society. And this, I think, we should have in these goals. And I had to struggle with these institutions, even to get this into this, uh, this sign here. Because many people, institutions, is that mental institutions? No, it's, this, it's the, the, uh, the backbone of a civilized society. And if you have those rules, I talk to lawyers now, uh, future lawyers, and if you have institutions that function well, and we do have work to do in Sweden too, I would say no, no more. We still have a lot of work to do, and I think we should have a revival of the ethical standards that we were, were expecting when Sweden took off economically. Um, yeah, I think by this I'm Coming to, the, no, I just worried about 17 then, uh, 17 also. 17 is the one that embraces this horizontal approach. Because these goals will not be achieved unless we get a mobilization of all good forces. We need the private sector, we need the uh, academic world, we need civil society, we need all of you. No one can do everything. But everybody can do something, wherever we are. You don't have to be Deputy Secretary General of the UN. You can help a kid from a country coming in here as a refugee to learn Swedish and feel some, that someone cares about them here in our country. There's always something you can do. And I think this partnership is necessary because these goals, when they were negotiated, I was leading the negotiations with Amina Mohammed. I saw the member states in the beginning, and I said, I just don't expect you to do an, an, a negotiation which ends up with the lowest common denominator. And they kept this almost to the, too much, because in the end, I was worried that they were too ambitious. 
So I said to them, good, you are ambitious. You didn't accept the lowest common denominator for these goals. But this also means you have to work in a new way. UN cannot do this on their own. Governments can't do this on their own. You've got to mobilize all the other actors that can make a difference. So, with this I would end, only I need, want to end on, an, on a quote from one of my heroes, Dag Hammarskjöld, because this is a good advice to you also in this quote. Uh, Dag Hammarskjöld in his book Vägmärken, Markings, uh, says that the future is two things. The future is, the, he, is he loved nature, the future is the horizon. I would say the vision. Everything you believe in, the principles, the values, what you came from, what you brought from your home, from your value systems, that goal is there, that vision is there. But then he says the future is not only the horizon, the, the vision, the future is also every step you take tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, next week, next month. In other words, you have to realize that it's a lot of hard work. Your studies, your future careers, the up, back and forth, the uphill battles you will have, the failures you will have. This is life. But you've got to stick to your vision, because otherwise you will move in zigzag back and forth and lose the sense of where you go. On the other hand, living only in the vision out there in the blue is not right, because it's a lot of hard work. And you can divide the future into the steps that you take. Del mål, as you probably say in the academic world. So thank you very much for inviting me. It's good to be back. Very nice to be with you. Thank you. <laughs>